Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths episode number 271. Given that it is that time of year, I couldn't not discuss the subject of St. Patrick. Hope you all had a lovely St. Patrick's Day yesterday. We had a fantastic parade here in Drogheda, uh, one of the biggest crowds ever seen. Uh, a very enjoyable event, and uh, I was playing, of course, with the brass band. I'm a little bit hoarse today from shouting out commands <coughs> at that parade, but uh, nonetheless, we'll plough ahead. Today, of course, being the day after St. Patrick's Day, the 18th of March, was the traditional date of a, uh, a festivity or a feast known as St. Sheila's Day. The tradition in pre-famine times being that Sheila was the spouse or the wife of St. Patrick. And the special indulgence granted to uh, Christians on this date was that they could continue uh, to uh, ignore, as it were, their Lenten fasts, uh, to break those Lenten fasts on both St. Patrick's Day and St. Sheila's Day. That led to a lot of revelry and uh, a lot of uh, uh, drinking, basically. Hope you're all in good form. If you're here, please do say hello and join in the conversation. I'd be glad to show your comments on the screen. And before we get started, there are a few announcements, not least the fact that if you've been on the Mythical Ireland website uh, over the last number of days, you'll have noticed something of a revamp of the website and a very special offer. Uh, I was going to say commemorating is probably the wrong word, celebrating the 24th birthday of Mythical Ireland. Mythical Ireland as a website was born on the 16th of March in the year 2000. Uh, and uh, the story about how it emerged and how it evolved over the years is the subject of a long read blog post over on the website right now on the blog. So get over there if you want to read that. That's mythicalireland.com. And uh, a special offer coinciding with that birthday is uh, three Mythical Ireland prints, whether unmounted or mounted, uh, medium or large, three for the price of two. If you happen to live in Ireland or the UK, you also get free postage on orders over 90 euros. So if you order, for instance, three uh, uh, large prints, for instance, you'll get three for the price of two and you'll get free postage as well. So get over to the website and choose your uh, images from our extensive collection. There's, I'm not sure exactly how many, but I think there's somewhere between 330 and 350 uh, images. Uh, so limited edition, limited edition, high quality prints, um, if you want to do that. Uh, so yes, the website, as I mentioned in the last live stream, uh, getting something of a spring cleaning and a bit of an update. So keep an eye on that. Also, it would be a very good idea if you're on the Mythical Ireland website to join the mailing list. Uh, as it says on the website, uh, it used to say subscribe to our emails. Now it says, become a Mythical Ireland insider. And that's uh, up for up-to-date news on discoveries and monuments and tours and all of that. And of course, special offers. Why not? But the reason I'm encouraging you to do it now is in the coming weeks, I am going to be offering something very, very special to subscribers to the email list. So it's a good idea to get on there now uh, uh, to take advantage of that. If you want to support Mythical Ireland, of course, as always, uh, you can become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. There's the address scrolling across the bottom of the screen throughout the broadcast. Uh, subscribers uh, to Patreon are given access to additional material, whether it be blog posts, uh, news updates, photographs, videos, podcasts, merchandise, and more. Uh, uh, the minimum pledge is $1 a month, but you really, to, to gain, uh, I suppose, something worthwhile, you probably really have to be um, at the $5 a, a month level. And if you're at the $10 a month level, which I think is the Bronze Age level, or is that the Iron Age level? It's the Bronze Age level. 
uh stone age is five dollars a month bronze age is ten dollars a month you also get access to my forthcoming book uh well one of my forthcoming books uh, that's the one uh that is the largest one written to date because i'm sharing the draft text of that with bronze age patrons and just to mention on um, the fornox monograph that book is all but finished but i am awaiting photography and details about photography from both uh, the National Monument Service and the National Museum. Uh, so as soon as I have that, uh, the book will be just at the stage where I'll be proofreading uh, and just filling in the last few gaps before sending it to print. It was due to be printed by the Spring Equinox, which is in a couple of days' time. That's not going to happen. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I know that if you've pre-ordered it, uh, you'll be patient with me because it promises to be a wonderful book and the first and only book about Fornox uh, if you discount the original paper published by Hartnett, uh, The Excavator, in 1957, which isn't really a book as such. It's an academic paper. I also want to just very briefly touch on something, and that is that uh, yesterday uh, on the Mythical Ireland community uh, a group on Facebook, uh, there was a little bit of argy-bargy uh, in relation to St. Patrick. This is something I've noticed in recent years uh, myself and the admins that people who, uh, some people uh, who never comment or post anything, arrive onto the page or the group uh, and start copying and pasting lots of information about St. Patrick that doesn't have any sort of uh, verifiable origin, as it were. And unfortunately, a trend in recent years has been for lots of arguments to break out around St. Patrick, and especially the, the, the idea that he committed genocide against the pagans. Now, we are going to touch on that in tonight's subject, because tonight is all about trying to separate fact from fable in relation to the story of St. Patrick's arrival to Ireland, and specifically his arrival here in the Boyne Valley. Now, I have been accused on occasion of engaging in censorship. What I am doing when I uh, block comments or I delete comments or I delete entire posts on my Mythical Ireland Facebook groups and pages is simply moderating those groups so that everybody can enjoy them. Uh, one post I stopped uh, comments on because it was getting very personal and in fact one person was completely banned for using obscene language uh, against another. I didn't think I'd have to explain all that, but I just thought I would take this opportunity to do so. If you're coming on to the Mythical Ireland groups and pages on social media, there's nothing wrong with being nice and being respectable and having a difference of opinion with others without the personal insults. There's enough of that all over the internet and all over social media, and I don't tolerate it. As far as I'm concerned, as I've said repeatedly in the past, if you're if you're welcoming guests into your house, the least you can expect is that those guests don't start wrecking the furniture. Anyway, enough said about that. Today is St. Sheila's Day, so happy St. Sheila's Day. We remember a, a figure of folklore who has almost completely been forgotten, uh, were it not for the work of Shane Lahan, uh, who is an academic scholar from University College Cork, who in the past decade has brought some light on this obscure uh, person uh, who ha has been completely overshadowed by Patrick. And of course, there's reasons for that. I'm going to say hello to some people before we continue. Tonight, I'll be mainly reading from the Vita Tripartita Sancti Patrici, which is the uh, tripartite life of St. Patrick, originally composed probably in the late 9th, 9th century uh, and uh, put together uh, in the 11th century as a a three-part or tripartite homily. Um, so I hope you enjoy our little exploration into the story of St. Patrick. Uh, but first of all, to welcome Rex Fortenbury, who's the first one to comment tonight, he says, greetings all you beautiful people from a cool and sunny Louisiana. Well, I'm glad to hear the sun is shining. It shone ever so briefly today, uh, this morning, but it has been mostly a cloudy day with a little bit of rain now and again. And Rex is indeed looking forward to uh, the episode Connie Reader is saying hello to everybody from the cold Illinois. Well, let's hope that spring is in the air for us northern hemispherers and that the cold will soon be a thing of the past. Joe Butler, Auntie Joe, is saying hello from Colorado. Happy Sheila's Day. Many happy returns to you, Joe. 
hope you're in good form and that you enjoyed your St. Patrick's Day. And McCallum says, hello, Anton and all the mighty to uh, hope everyone enjoyed their St. Patrick's Day. Looking forward to today's episode. As always, it was minus two Celsius earlier with snow. Now it's two Celsius, dull and cloudy. So a great day for stories and perhaps a little beverage. Mm, well, indeed. A little. Uh, don't do what many Irish people do on St. Patrick's weekend and get scuttered. Uh, as we say in this part of the world. Lily Shambles is in the house. Good evening to you. Hope you are all so well, Lily. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome you along. And Scott Doherty is here. Beautiful spring day in Southern Oregon. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm glad to hear that spring has sprung in your part of the world. Michael Trott doesn't know anything about spring because it's autumn where he is. An early autumn fine day in New Zealand. Uh, a very good morning to you, Michael. Happy Tuesday from us it's a bank holiday or a public holiday here in the republic of ireland i always get a little bit confused about the time i'm having to remember remember that it's monday but anyway i'll be all right al Kowser says alan and galway it's wetter than cardi b's goldfish here <laughs> yes unfortunately uh, in ireland uh, we get a lot of rain and uh, the further west you go the more rain you get uh, Al, I'm sorry to hear it, but sure, maybe the sun will shine so soon. Not in the next few hours, because it's nighttime, understandably. Britt Griffin is here. Bitter and snowy here. Northern Ontario is never ready for springtime celebrations. Happy to be back after missing a few episodes. We're delighted to have your company, Britt. Mariana Dunn is saying hello. Banakti, dear Tua and Anthony from sunny Alexandria, Virginia. See, I told you, the sun is always shining somewhere. You know, Jacqueline Kelly Adams is here. Fr Hello from a nice, sunny Pacific Northwest. G good to see you again. Sounds like the sun is shining on the West Coast. Brilliant stuff. Glad to hear. Teresa Collins. La Fela Homa. Sheila Homa. Giov Golair Atua. Thanks, Teresa. And many happy returns to you. Lexi Erickson is in the house. Still celebrating the birthday, are we? Um, hello, Anthony, Tom, and the Tua. You're very welcome, Lexi. Hope you're in good form. Brendan Byrne is saying good evening, everyone. March, mini weather is the story of the day. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit mixed, to say the least. Uh, but I did notice, was it yesterday or the day, the day before? We had a very pleasant evening one of the days, and it was very clear, and the sun shone, and the day seemed so much longer. Of course, we will be springing forward here in Ireland. It's the weekend after next. Uh, to catch up, some of you in the, in, in, the, in the US and Canada have already sprung forward. And then there'll be an extra hour of... Uh, daylight in the evening time. So I'm looking forward to that. No, don't tell people to go to the website now, says she, uh, Lily. Yes, but uh, Sheila, I was going to call you. Lily, uh, just bookmark it now and, and, and maybe visit afterwards. Um, Barbara Murphy is saying hello from a nice sunny Tucson, Arizona. Home after helping celebrate uh, Lexi's birthday and uh, glad to hear that you got home safely. Ulla Conrad is in Denmark. A very good evening to you. Ulla, I hope you're in good form. Happy St. Sheila's Day to you. Tom King is here. Hello there, Anthony and all the mighty Tua. Hope all in good fettle. Another week rolls in and it's story time. Looking forward to the story as always. Brilliant stuff, Tom. Hope the forge is well lit. Uh, although it's mild. It was 14 Celsius today, but you wouldn't have thought it. It was so dull. It's better when, it's, when the sun is shining. Elaine Lingenfelter didn't get a notice. Boo hoo. Hi, Anthony and the two. I hope everyone had a great St. Patrick's Day. It's a coolish day, 15 Celsius. Just a degree warmer than it was here today in Ireland in the Boyne Valley. Can't speak for everyone in Ireland, though. It might have been cooler elsewhere. Uh, who else is here? Wayne Bird is in the house. Uh, hello, Wayne. Good evening to you. Adina Sparks is saying, Afternoon, Anthony and the two. I hope everyone is well. A windy day here in New Mexico. Windy, but dry and <laughs> Tara wants to be on the live stream. Uh, Amanda Morgan says hello Anthony and everyone. Uh, good day Amanda, I'm not sure where you are. Um, good evening slash afternoon slash morning slash good night wherever you are. Arvon Gaunt, hello good people and the rest of us. Uh, Arvon <laughs> Slonja. Michael Trot is saying happy post St. Patrick's Day, St. Sheila's Day. Facts before fables. Keep it bright and respectful, and respectful if a new visitor. It's not difficult, is it? Mog Downey is in the house. Howdy all. Skidding in late. We've been enjoying your posts and your contributions to the Mythical Ireland community, Mog. Always interesting. And I know, because I know you, 
how well traveled you are in that respect, you have probably seen many, many little nooks and crannies and corners of the Boyne Valley that many people haven't. Uh, so always a pleasure. Gordon Farrell says, has to be said, Anthony, keep the cobwebs away. Ah, sure. Look, look, one or it wasn't too bad yesterday, in fairness. Uh, but one person was upset that their post was deleted. It's like, I just didn't want to have to deal with it on St. Patrick's Day because if you post something about St. Patrick on St. Patrick's Day, somebody will jump in and say, he murdered all the pagans, you know, and it just descends into mud slinging and slagging. Like, if it didn't do that, we would have what's called a respectable debate and an interesting conversation. I got caught by the time change in i was in denver last week and set the alarm for that but of course i'm back in tucson so it's an hour earlier on the clock aha so you really have to pay attention to when the broadcast is coming on valerie gallagher is in the house good evening to you valerie uh, or good afternoon should i say and i'm glad to hear it's sunny in rhode island brilliant stuff sally siggins is saying hello from a wet and windy sligo busy weekend welcoming visitors back to carol moore and i saw that brilliant stuff carol moore now open to the public again after being shut for the winter. My parents got married on Paddy's Day 43 years ago. I believe it used to be the only day in Lent you could get married once upon a time. Wow. Interesting how times change, isn't it? Uh, Sally, hope you're in good form and I hope uh, might see you on Thursday. I'm in the Sligo area on Thursday. Not entirely sure whether we've got time for Carol Moore because we're going to other places. But if we're in the area, we will definitely drop in and say hello. Who else? Uh, Barbara Scott Lay Gibson is saying it's around 60 degrees here in southeastern Colorado. That sounds kind of warmish, uh, Scott. I hope, uh, it's, I hope it's not raining anyway. I can hear the rain on the uh, on the roof of the library here. So it's definitely raining here. Uh, Burr Whelan is saying hi, Anthony. Hi to uh, recovering after the shenanigans yesterday in Grand Canaria. God bless it, Patrick. Lol. <laughs> Who needs an excuse? No matter where you are in the world, you can raise a glass to the bowl, Paddy, and maybe raise a glass to his former spouse. Former? Well, I suppose uh, Patrick's been dead for 1500 years. Um, but yeah, let's raise a glass in her honor, too. Uh, Emma. Uh, Fitzsimons is saying hello from near the banks of the Borora River, whose source is in on the Lock and Lay. Lock and Lay is Cavan, isn't it? Uh, brilliant, uh, Emma. Uh, Lock and Lay is the hill where there was once a lake that is now dried up, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think there are some communications masts up there, but there are some ancient cairns or mounds, aren't there? Emma, good to hear from you. I hope you're in good form. Uh, Kathy Ift is watching from Washington State, where it's sunny. And 70F. What is 70F in C? It's 21 degrees. That's nice. That is nice. Spread it around, Kathy. Spread it around. Uh, Ronald Burgess is in New York on a cool but sunny day. Look, when the sun is shining, it's a bonus. You know, Michael Pike is in the house. Greetings, Anthony and the two. Uh, Slonja, uh, 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 we call Conisata to Cyrene. Uh, Kieran is saying hello from a sunny Seattle. Well, I believe Washington State is the place to be right now. It's 21 Celsius. Wow, nice one. Ian Whelan, hi to all. Listening with a right wobble after serving a Liverpool Paddy's Day. Love your fine ways. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the celebration. I didn't overly enjoy it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> 322 Messenger says, if St. Dararca of Ireland's feast day on... Uh, it's Saint, sorry, it's Saint Dererka of Ireland's feast day on the 22nd of March. Dererka is Patrick's sister. If they are both both mythical, then is it the fact that the spring equinox falls between this? Yeah, actually, that is a fact. It falls between the dates. Uh, I'm not saying uh, Patrick is entirely mythical, of course. I, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but uh, trying to disentangle fact from fable is what we're trying to do and uh, that's not to say we will have any measure of success but we are irish uh, uh, so we're known to be a little bit stubborn in these matters gordon farrell is saying anthony i've just started work on the meeting of ushin and st patrick it's quite difficult to find a definitive story a lot of modern twists on the meeting uh the best sources would be of course um uh, good scholarly translations of um what's it called Colloquy of the Ancients. <clears throat> Can't think of the Irish for it. 
Dakota saying, Come on, will you wake up? Uh, it's called Akalov na Shonorak. Um, a couple of there is a penguin translation of Akalov na Shonorak, which is quite accessible. Uh, it is called Tales of the Elders of Ireland, a new translation of Akalov na Shonorak by Anne Dooley and Harry Rowe. Rowe. Sorry, it's Oxford, Oxford World Classics. Should be able to get that one fairly handy on the interweb, uh, new or secondhand. Uh, that's a, that's a, a very good, uh, probably a very good starting place for you. But good luck with it, uh, Gordon. Look forward to seeing the finished work. And if it's anything like your previous uh, works, it'll be superb. Anthony, where did you go last week? I was worried you were sucked into a wormhole. Yeah, we I had an extra broadcast the following day. The face, something happened on Facebook. It wasn't, there was nothing wrong with the streaming here. I didn't have any interruption. And the YouTubers had no interruption. It was only the people watching on Facebook lost the last minute or, or so. So I don't actually know what happened. Ask Mark Zuckerberg. Send him a letter. Send him, a, send him an, uh, an angry email demanding to know why uh, Live Irish Mits was curtailed by a minute or two last week. Astro says, hello all, brilliant name, by the way. Astro as in astronomical, I presume, and uh, all things related to the stars. Mark Monaghan, hello, sound very low, and I'm not that old. I'll try and watch my language while a lot of gone beans about. <laughs> At this time of year in particular, uh, as I say, on St. Patrick's Day, a lot of people start posting stuff on Facebook groups that they don't usually post in people who you don't hear from from one end of the day one end of the year to the other suddenly start basically copying and pasting uh and uh, some of it's good and some of it's nonsense hemp flower is in northern british columbia a very good afternoon to you thank you for joining us watching on youtube and of course if any of you are watching on youtube do not forget to subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell because that means whenever there's a new live stream or a new video upload you get notified <laughs> Excuse me. Tazira says, hello, sorry, me and Amadeus missed last week. Hope all the two are well. There's no need to apologize, Tazira. We all have lives. It's perfectly okay. Plus, the episodes all get saved, so you can watch them back. Hope Amadeus is in good form and uh, heard uh, Coda uh, giving <coughs> full belt on the barking there a couple of moments ago. And the full Irish, uh, I, I blame the gatekeeper. Good evening, great and good to uh, another fine day on the sod. Yes, indeed, Gary. Um, and uh, sometimes one has to be a gatekeeper to keep the gate crashers out. Valentina Bernardi says, uh, good evening, Glastonbury. I was told that yesterday was not only St. Patrick, but that it used to be also St. Joseph of Arimathea, at least here in Glastonbury. Oh, interesting. Very interesting connections with Patrick in Glastonbury. I've heard claims he's supposed to be buried in Down Patrick, and of course that didn't suit uh, the uh, the good ecclesiastics in Armagh who wanted, who wanted him based there. I've heard also that he might be buried near Ballina in County Mayo. And uh, he's also supposed to be buried in the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey, which is remarkable. Also, a little place there near Weiriall Hill called Becker, Beckery, which is apparently from the Irish Bug era, small Ireland, which is apparently the place where St. Bridget stayed while she visited Glastonbury. And of course, I, I know you know this, Valentina, but others may not know this, that up on St. Michael's Tor on the top of Glastonbury Hill, or on the top of Glastonbury Tor, uh, is a depiction of Bridget milking a cow. Fascinating stuff. But yeah, and of course, Joseph of Arimathea is said to have brought, uh, said to have been the one who planted the Holy Thorn, now sadly destroyed, although I believe there were um, saplings successfully taken from it and being nursed elsewhere, but uh, visited the Holy Thorn with Richard Moore on Weiriall Hill in 2006 or 2007 i can't remember exactly which year it was uh but uh joseph of arimathea of course uh said to have brought the holy thorn and that it was grown from one of the thorns on the crown of thorns that was placed on jesus's head fascinating stuff there and again disentangle the uh, mythological material from the historical mm. 
Going to break out the pipe now, says Rex. Don't start coughing again, Anthony. Well, you, you enjoy your pipe. I'll try to ignore the smoke billowing around me through the internet. Sandra Boothroyd is here. Evening, just caught you in time. Yes, you did, because haven't started yet. Tuesday Thompson is saying, Happy Mythology Monday. Last week, we got to say Happy Tuesday Mythology, uh, Happy Mythology Tuesday even, because we, we had an extra um, uh, episode on Tuesday. Um, now, you see, Sean... This is the sort of stuff I'm trying to address. How did the person, Patrick, become our patron saint when he came to murder the Serpent Clan? Well, uh, I'm not sure that if you read Patrick in his own words, his confessio, he's not much of a murderer. I think the later propagandists, the later church scribes, uh, made him do all sorts of things. I'm going to look at some of that tonight. And in any case, what is the Serpent Clan and what is the evidence for it? You know, Had somebody else on the, on the Mythical Ireland blog earlier on claiming that um, uh, Patrick came to kill the the Cora serpent worshippers. Well, he did kill a serpent called Cora, according to uh, folklore. But the idea that people were, uh, before Patrick arrived, were uh, Cora serpent worshippers. I'm not sure that has much uh, basis. In fact, if you have uh, the information to back it up, please give it to us and we'll have a look at it. But uh, I, I'm immediately sceptical, I have to be honest. Emma Fitzsimons is saying, yes, Loch and Lay means Lake of the Cures, now dried up. Some unexcavated cairns there too. Interesting stuff. And thank you for the information. Mavanway Millward, apologies a bit late. Hope everyone had a grand St. Patrick's Day and a very happy birthday to Saoirse Michandal. Yes, indeed. Breha Homa Ditch a Saoirse. I hope you had a great uh, day. Another March hair like myself. Mavanway, happy St. Sheila's Day to you also. Uh, Just Aviation is saying hello. Uh, very good evening. Good afternoon to you. Hope you're in good form. Welcome to the live stream. An, an, Angie, uh, al, Angie. Saskia is in dire need of getting out into the garden. Getting very feisty in her old age. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Angie al, al Tank. Hello from Cork. Up oh, there. Come on. The rebels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a funny uh, a funny graphic or a funny meme uh, in, in which uh, Cork, the outline of County Cork uh, and the rest of Ireland was shown on a map. And over Cork in, in, in lettering was uh, um, Oscar winner. And over the rest of Ireland was not an Oscar winner. <laughs> Up the Republic of Cork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, catching up. Anyone else? Anyone else? Michael Trot is saying hello to Tom. Lots of conversation going on, which is brilliant. Um, who are we missing? Are we missing anyone? We probably are. Uh, Joe Krause, uh, hello everyone, good morning from Melbourne, a very happy Tuesday to you Joe, we're still in Monday and it's St Sheila's Day here in this part of the world, hope you had a great St Patrick's weekend and that uh, the day is going to be a good one for you, John Inman, sleepy all day, splendid day, Irish being abundantly sang in Eureka, California area, the Irish settled here and worked in every part of the economy. Brilliant stuff, John. Belated happy St. Patrick's Day and a happy St. Sheila's Day to you. Karen Ann McDermott McDougall is saying, looking for recommendations for historically accurate books on the general history of Ireland. Mm. Wow. Yes. And that is a very, very good thing to be looking for. There is a very good book. I mean, I don't know what sort of level of stuff you're looking for, Karen. A very good starting place is a book called uh, History of Ireland in 250 Episodes. Edited by Jonathan Barden. Brilliant book. Great starting place. Um, but uh, perhaps you're looking for something deeper. I'm not sure. But there's a lot of material there. Ha, huh, says Valentina. I never saw Bridget milking a cow. Got to go back up and check. Yeah, so if you go up the tour, uh, up the steps and up the path, it's the side of the tour facing you. It's facing west. So as you arrive at the tour, it's up there. Can't remember at what level. But one of the... Um, I think it's a, an engraving in relief. I'm pretty sure it's Bridget milking a cow, yeah. I can see Arthur's tomb from my windows. If even Patrick is buried there, I have a very good selection of famous dead people as neighbours. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, or potentially, uh, yes, yeah. 
The serpent clan from the Middle East where the serpent was the symbol of hidden knowledge. Yeah, that all sounds a bit too vague, Sean. I'm sorry to say I, I'd need more than that, to be honest, before I'd start believing that there was this widespread uh, serpent clan. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's all I can say about that for the moment. Pat Lake O'Connell, he says, greetings from Vermont. We happened to watch a PBS special called My Ireland with Adrian Dunbar. And you, Anthony, were in the episode. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was a great day. Really enjoyed uh, meeting uh adrian a uh, wonderful guy uh, very very personable and uh he gave me uh uh he, i gave him a copy of my book and he stood into photographs and he gave me autographs and the whole lot which was great snapper earl says hello from nys usa new york state oh it took me a second i'm sorry snapper uh, it took me a second karen ann um uh, is saying that she's in halifax in nova scotia new scotland Good afternoon to you. Paul Campbell is uh, saying greetings from the Prime Meridian time zone. <laughs> Paul, I hope you're in good form. Um, wasn't the serpent connected to goddess worship? So perhaps St. Patrick banishing the snakes Marlon was symbolic. Yeah, and that's been said quite a lot. And, and uh, I, I'd buy into that to a degree. Absolutely, I would. Uh, but I, I just this thing about there being a very specific... Uh, snake worshipping cult uh serpent should i say worshipping cult hmm. i'd need more information alan hoskins hi there everyone a late check-in not from balana killaloo tonight but from near athen rye galway we'll have to catch up later though have a great evening well you also have a great evening and i uh, hope the fields aren't too low uh, yeah, low light of fields of athen rye suzanne march says good morning from the sunshine coast hinterland queensland australia very good morning to you suzanne happy tuesday uh, glad uh, to welcome you along, a long, a long, not a long. Uh, I was thinking of elongated. Uh, anyway, um, you're all in good form. We are ready to start. Um, I will do that now. Oh, wow. So right now, yeah. So this is the sort of stuff, and it happens every every single St. Patrick's weekend. Um, you know, uh, somebody is getting riled and getting hot under the collar about Patrick. And, uh, you know, anyway, we're going to get into that shortly. Barb, Jordan is here. Hello, Barb. Welcome to the show. Hope you're in good form. Happy St. Sheila's Day. And I hope you had a nice St. Patrick's Day. Mythical kettle on the forge on rapid boil. So there's something about Tom's kettle and indeed his fire that makes it boil quicker than other kettles. Mm. So if you want a quick cup of tea, you know where to go. <laughs> Spread it around, Tom. Cup of tea for everyone, you know. Yes, indeed. Give me a second. Ali is here. First time tuning in for a while. Thrilled to be here from Tucson, Arizona. I've missed the tour. We've missed you. Ali, good afternoon to you. Welcome to the live stream. Hope you enjoy it. Happy St. Sheila's Day. Aries or lions? This is an important question, Brendan. And how does that make a difference in terms of how quickly the kettle boils? Mob is saying hello from Killarney. Hello to the Killarney mob. Ah, uh, sure, look, wonderful, beautiful part of the world. Uh, Mob, you're very welcome. Man, do type fast, yes. So tonight I am going to talk briefly. So you may have seen in recent days, uh, on Saturday, which was the 16th, I was featured in an hour-long program about the Boyne River. Uh, 
which is a part of a wonderful series of radio programs on RTE Radio 1, hosted by Philip Boucher Hayes. And he was talking to conservationists and nature people and anglers and farmers and producers uh, along the course of the Boyne River uh, from source to sea. And I was the last one featured. He met me at the estuary of the river. And because of the weekend that was in it, we discussed Patrick and we were trying to get into a uh, discussion about well, what aspects of the story are verifiably true and what aspects are there sort of doubts over. So the person who's challenged me, challenged me right now on one of the Facebook uh, pages uh, is attempting to say that I'm disputing accredited academia, which I'm not. I'm simply pointing out that even Patrick's own confessio doesn't tell us. There's uh, So I've repeatedly said, I've repeatedly repeated <laughs> uh, something that I heard somebody else say, but I can't remember who, that the known facts about St. Patrick could be written on the pass back of a postage stamp, but uh, the amount of folklore about him would fill many volumes. And I still hold to that, uh, because even if you read his own words in the Confessio, there is a difficulty. Like, for instance, where uh, where, where was he born? Uh, Banavan Tabernia. Apparently, they don't even know where that is. It was either on the west coast of Britain or on the west coast of Wales, and uh, the exact location is not known today. Another thing is, where exactly did he light the Paschal fire? Was it at Slane? How do we know that it definitely was? Do we know that it definitely was? So these are the sort of uh, intricate details that we have to tease out. Now, I should also uh, uh, preamble this by or uh, always get your caveat in first. So remember, I'm not an ac academic scholar. I didn't study folklore or mythology at university, nor did I study archaeology. Uh, I've spent 25 years of my life uh, reading material, exploring the landscape, talking to people, uh, visiting monuments and uh, making connections. Um, that doesn't mean I'm right. Uh, so always remember that, that no one person holds all the information or all the knowledge. And if that person claims to do so, I back away from them fairly quickly. There are plenty of people on the Internet who seem to speak uh, unimpeachable and indisputable truths all the time. Uh, but uh, when you ask them for sources, those sources are not always forthcoming. Anyway, uh, bear with me. Let's get going because it's, oh my God, look at the time. So I'm reading from a section of the tripartite life. And as I said earlier, originally written, they reckon, the scholars reckon in the ninth century. I believe this is um, Whitley Stokes's translation. Um, sorry you can find that out fairly quickly so Whitley Stokes we've encountered lots and lots um, over the last 270 episodes yes this is indeed it is indeed a Whitley Stokes translation um, and I'm just going to read the section that pertains to Patrick's arrival in the Boyne Valley and his lighting of the Paschal fire and his challenge uh, against the High King of Tara and the Druids uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just look at that little bit, um, which 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 is going to represent maybe um, enough reading and exploration for the next hour anyway. Sorry, I'm trying to find my way. So I have a printout of the material, but I would also like to have the, uh, the book open on screen in front of me because it's a little bit faded and sometimes can be a little bit difficult to read. So, Behu Parik. Now, let me just scroll to the page that I need to be at in case I need to refer to the screen. And now we'll get going. Lily Shambles saying, All I know about St. Patrick is he seems to be the patron saint of getting rattled, especially a rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Never mind. Especially in America. I'm interested to know what Anthony has to say on the subject. <laughs> <clears throat> then came Benane into his service, that's B-E-N-E for the N, and Patrick slept among his household, and all the odorous flowers which the gilly, Benane, found 
he would put into the cleric's bosom. Uh, gilly is an Irish word that I think means servant. Magulla, Forig, for instance, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Fitzpatrick, <coughs> Magulla Forig, uh, <coughs> the son of the servant of Patrick, found he would put into the cler cler cleric's bosom. Wow, Benane give him, gave him flowers. Patrick's household said to Benane, do not that, say they, lest Patrick should awake. Said Patrick, he will inherit my kingdom, which sounds very Christ-like altogether, doesn't it? What can he promise him? He went to Inver Boinge, which of course is the estuary of the River Boyne. He found fish therein. He bestowed a blessing upon it, and the estuary is fruitful. Interesting uh, change of tense. He bestowed, past tense, a blessing on it, and the estuary is fruitful. Present tense. He found a wizard in that place. Now, wizard is a poor translation. Uh, the, uh, the, the word is druid. He found a three. Uh, he found a druid. Now, so let's change that. Remember that Stokes's translations are a little, in their language, are a little bit archaic. A lot of the material that Stokes, look, Stokes was a genius. He was a savant. There's no doubt about it. And we're very grateful to him because a lot of material that was translated by him hasn't been retranslated. But we could do with modern translations. Uh, you know, we need a whole new generation of translators to tell these stories in modern language, you know. He found a druid in that place who mocked at Mary's virginity. Patrick saned the earth and saned, S-A-I-N-E-D is a word that means he blessed the earth. So let's just say he blessed the earth and it swallowed up the wizard or the druid. So this is interesting. And this is one of the many instances in the hagiographies of Patrick. So remember, as well as the tripartite life, there's Muraku's life of St. Patrick. The Confessio is Patrick in his own words, apparently. And uh, I think a, a lot of um, scholars are satisfied that there was a, a real person called Patrick and that he did write his own uh, biography, as it were, his confession. Um, so this is one of these incidences, incidents that gives rise to the belief among modern pagans in particular, but not specifically modern pagans, about the idea that Patrick did murder and uh, commit atrocities against the pagans. But remember, we're talking about a we're we're talking about ecclesiastical scribes using the word pagan as a pejorative, uh, as a word that means basically. Uh, somebody who doesn't believe in Christ and who doesn't believe in the new faith. Uh, and that they're all treated as being dark and evil and, you know, um, not, uh, won't be welcomed into uh, the everlasting kingdom at the end of time and all that stuff. Marcus has joined us, Irish technical thinker. A very good evening to you. Um, and this is just one. There's another big one coming up later, which we'll talk more about. Then went Patrick from Patrick's Island Past Cunnala, uh, I think that might be Cunnala Merhevna, which is the old name for this area of Ireland, uh, the county of Louth. Uh, Patrick's Island is believed to be off the coast of Skerries, uh, where some people believe that was the very first place in Ireland that he visited, uh, which is funny because it's not really in Ireland, it's off the coast of Ireland, but you get what I mean. Till he anchored at Inver Brenea. Then he went to Inver Slan, and the clerics hid their vessel in that stead and went to shore to put their weariness from them and to rest. So they hid their boat so that they could find it again and get back into the water so that it wouldn't be stolen from them in case they needed to make an exit. And there the swineherd of Dicu, son of Trichem, found them in the stead wherein today stands Pat Patrick's barn. When he saw the sages and clerics, He thought they were robbers or thieves, so he went and told his master. Thereupon, Dichu, D-I-C-H-U. Now, Dichu is a name that we encountered in the story Altram Chiagov at, their, at uh, Bruna Bonia. Dichu was um, the steward or the servant of the steward of the brew, wasn't that right? Something like that. Thereupon, Dichu came and set his dog at the clerics. <laughs> wow. Nice welcome. 
so much for the Irish. Cade Mila Falja, how are you? You know? Yes, correct, Michael. Pagan originally implied a villager or a rural person. Correct. Then Patrick chanted the prophetic verse. Ne tra tradas domine bestis animus. I can't read it. It's very faded. Sorry, give me one second. Ne tradas domine bestis animus congentis tibi. I don't know what that translates it into English. And the dog became silent. Actually, should be possible to translate it. To, there is a Latin to English translator on Google. When Dehu saw Patrick, grief of heart seized him, and he believed, and Patrick baptized him. And that's the way it happens, folks. It has to be treated as mythological content. A person who just suddenly believes and is baptized and converted there on the spot. Hmm. Perhaps a tad credulous, you know. A bit disappointed that he went to Scaries when Glendalock was available, says Brendan. <laughs> Problem with Glendalock is you can't see Glendalock from Tara, which is something we'll get to now in a moment. Add Astro Music. Hello to the lovely to uh, Patrick's Island off Scaries. Wow. There you go. So that it is so so that he is the first who received in Ulster baptism and belief from Patrick. Deku was the first in Ulster. Then Deku offered the barn to Patrick. Uh, 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 and remember, this material ties in very closely with the material we've been looking at in the last few episodes, which was the first chapter of Marianne Elliott's The Catholics of Ulster, uh, and uh, with specific reference to what was happening in the med early medieval period. God's blessing on Dehu, who gave me the barn. May he have afterwards a heavenly home, bright, pure, great. God's blessing on Dehu, Dehu with a number of children. No offspring or descendant of his shall die whose dot, dot, dot ellipsis is not lasting. Something missing from the text. Patrick went to preach to Milieu, M-I-L-I-U-E, as he had said. And he took with him gold to impress belief upon him, for he knew that Milieu was greedy for gold. It is M-I-L-I-E-U, isn't it? Just let me just double check that. Yeah, it looks like it. Now, when Milieu heard that Patrick had arrived, he was not willing to believe and to quit the bad heathen law in which he was biding. It's a strange one, isn't it? Some stranger from the uh, Roman Empire, probably Welsh, maybe uh, somewhere else in Britain, comes over the sea and starts telling you, come here, listen, now, all that stuff you believe is a load of nonsense. Here's a new belief and you must, you know. He deemed it a shame to believe in his slave and to be subject to him. This is the counsel which the devil taught him. See what they're doing here, folks. Very quickly, we get the devil involved, you know. He entered his palace along with his gold and his silver, and he himself set fire to it and burnt it with the whole of his treasures, and his soul went to hell. Then Patrick stood still on the southern side of Slemish. There stands a cross in that place, and he saw the fire from afar. He was silent for the space of two hours or three hours. Well, which is it? Two hours or three hours. I mean, we Irish, sometimes we tell stories we don't get into very much in the way of specifics. While he was silent, and who knows what an hour was? In the ninth century. Clocks didn't come along till a lot later. While he was sighing and groaning, this he said. You is the fire of Milieu's house. Yon, should I say? Yon is the fire of Milieu's house, saith Patrick. After burning himself amidst his house, lest he should believe in God at the end of his life. He on whom his bane is lying, saith he. Of him shall be neither king nor crown prince, and in bondage will his offspring and his seed abide forever, and his soul shall not come out of hell up to doom or after doom. Wow. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Patrick. Really, that's some judgment. And again, if you examine Patrick in his own words, in his confessio, he is a much more humble man. This, the hagiographies make him out to be 
a tad on the judgmental side, a tad on the nasty side, pernicious, um, uh, vengeful, wrathful. Does that sound familiar, folks? Yes, it should. And when he had spoken these words, he turned right hand wise and went back again into Ulster until he came to my Inish, to Dechu, son of Trichem. And there he stayed a long while, sowing belief, until he brought all the Ulstermen by the net of the gospel to the harbour of life. Oh, that sounds lovely. So basically, he spent a while with Dicku, figuring, I've been successful with this guy, so why don't I go back to him and spend a bit of time? And sure, all of a sudden, everybody in Ulster believes. And as we saw in the last few episodes, in reality, what happened was the Christian church and the monasteries got into bed with the kings, metaphorically, and there was a symbiotic relationship between them. And a lot of what was considered pagan was actually preserved. Uh, not thrown on the fire, the fire of judgment, the fire of hell, as it were. Not at all. Then Patrick went from from the barn southwards that he might preach to Ross, son of Trichem. He it is that dwelt in Derlus to the south of Down Patrick. There stands a small town there today, namely Bright. A town called Bright. Where is Bishop Lorne, L-O-A-I-R-N, who dared to blame Patrick for driving away a boy who was playing close to his church. Now, while Patrick was going along his way, he saw a tender youth herding swine. Moche was his name, M-O-C-H-A-E. Patrick preached to him and baptised him and tonsured him and gave him a gospel and a credence table. Interesting. He gives the boy the tonsure, which is the the the, uh, the haircut uh, associated with monks. So just like that, Patrick preaches to the boy. Suddenly he's he's baptized. He has a tonsure and he's a Christian. Just like that. And imagine the boy going home to his parents and saying, "What the hell happened to your hair? Uh, I met this strange man. Who is he? Wait till I get me hands on him." <laughs> <laughs> That's which is exactly the way an Irish uh, parent would react today if their child came home and said they'd met a stranger who'd converted them to some strange religion and cut their hair. <clears throat> Brandon tells us that there, there is a road that leads from Glendalough to Tara that was discovered during the building of Turlock Hill Power Station. If my father was to be believed. St. Kevin's Road. Oh, yeah, St. Kevin's Road. I need to check this out. It was to lead from the East Coast to the Midlands, but I have no proof other than my father's. Road. I've heard of St. Kevin's Road, all right. I think there's a part of it up there at Blessington, uh, if I'm not uh, 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 mistaken. And I have often have been mistaken, so. What happened to your head, boy? Says Shelley Roshi. Yeah, exactly. You know, and uh, a quick hunt for the mysterious man who's going around cutting children's hair. Uh, anyway. And he gave him also at another time a crozier that he had been that had been bestowed on them by God, no less. To wit, it fell from heaven with its head in Patrick's bosom and its foot in Moche's bosom. And this is the etech or winged thing of Moche of Noindrum. And Moche promised a shaven pig every year to Patrick. And this is still offered. So there you go, folks. Let's disentangle the fact from the fable here for a moment. Whatever about the possibility that Patrick visited Ulster, uh, the likelihood that a crozier fell out of heaven and its head landed in Patrick's lap and the far end of it landed in Moche's lap, a uh, little bit less than likely. Let's, let's just call it as it is. You know, it's one of those things that you read and go, ah, no, that didn't really happen. And if I'm speaking in a little bit of a manner of Father Dougal from Father Ted, you'll know why. Now, when the high tide of Easter drew nigh, Patrick thought that there was no place fitter for the chief solemnity of the year, that is, for celebrating Easter, than in my Bray, M-A-G-B-R-E-G, -E or the Plain of Brega, in the place wherein was the chief abode of the idolatry and wizardry of Ireland, or, if you prefer, the idolatry and druidry of Ireland, to wit in Tara. Then they bade farewell to Dichu, son of Thrichem, and put their vessel to sea and went on till they anchored in Inverculpa. Now, it's all called Inverculpa here 
C O L P T H A, which is the ancient name of the Boyne Estuary. And you'll know that earlier on it was called Inverboinja, the, uh, the river mouth of the Boyne. Not sure why they're changing uh, it, but anyway, uh, two names for the same place, basically. Archaeostronomy database is saying, Hi, friends. The equinox approaches. Equinox is coming. Yes. Making sure I haven't missed anyone. <clears throat> they left their vessel in the estuary. So Patrick and his company, according to the Tripart Life, did not sail from the Boyne Estuary to Slane, which they could have done, by the way, but they didn't. And they went along the land till they came to Ferta Fer Fake, the graves of Fake's men. And Patrick's tent was pitched in that place and he struck the Paschal fire. Now, one of the things that I was having a, a little bit of a discussion uh, with a, a person on Facebook just as we started, it was he's basically saying I'm disputing accredited academia. I said, no, I'm asking when I say the, the known facts about Patrick's life. So we've two examples straight away. Uh, Patrick tells us he was from uh, uh, Banavan, Tibernia, but nobody knows where that is. And uh, he also says that the, well, the tripartite life tells us that uh, the Paschal fire was lit at Ferta Fer Fake. Now, how do we know that's slain? We don't, because as it has been pointed out by archaeologists and other scholars, uh, there's no mention of Ferta Fer Fake in any other document so far that so far as we know, none that is extant. The reason that the Paschal fire is assumed to have happened at Slain is that afterwards the first bishop was consecrated by Patrick at Slain. Uh, so we assume that Ferta Fer Fake is slain, but we don't know. So when I say the verifiable facts, that's what I'm talking about. The verifiable facts. I'm not saying that we throw out the confessio uh, and and ever we don't throw out the uh, the uh, the uh, the baby with the bath water, as it were. But okay. So before I continue, just a little aside, which is not really an aside. It's very relevant. Until maybe 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, a lot of the history of Christianity in Ireland was written by Christians, written by Jesuits, written by Benedictines, written by uh, Christian brothers, written by cardinals and bishops. I'm not kidding you. If you look at um, what's it called, The Course of Irish History, which is a book that was very popular for decades in Ireland, the chapter about the coming of Christianity in Ireland was written by Tomás O'Fee, who later became Cardinal Tomás O'Fee. Um, hardly what you call an unbiased um, uh, uh, view of all of this material. And some of it is treated quite reverentially, like there's no dispute offered about the plausibility of some of the things that are, let's be quite frank, Im, quite implausible. And we investigate a couple more of those before the evening is out. Kelly B is in the house. Hello, Kelly B. You're very welcome. Happy St. Sheila's Day to you. Yes. And he struck the Paschal fire. So basically, in the space of one sentence, we've gone from Inverculpa to Ferta Fer Fake, and the Paschal fire is lit. Wow. A huge, major, major moment in the history of Ireland, which is covered with or coated with a veneer of mythological material. A veneer, it's not a veneer. It's it's not just a thin coating, it's a very thick coating. Um, anyway, let us uh, continue. It happened then that that was the time at which was celebrated the high tide of the heathen, to wit, the Feast of Tar Tara. Now, this is called in Irish. So on the left-hand page is the text as it is in Irish. Some of it's a little bit of it is in Latin. And on the right is the English translation, which I love about Stokes's works, that you get to see the Irish. Well, 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 what is the Feast of Tara? It's Fesh Chaura or Fesh Chauro. 
what is the difficulty immediately with this? What he's saying is, Patrick arrived at Furtafur Faik, which has been assumed by pretty much every historian to be the Hill of Slain, which is literally about seven miles from where I'm sitting. Uh, no more than maybe seven or eight miles, uh, about 10 kilometers or so. Let me let me quickly measure it. I'm going to use Google Earth to do that. As the crow flies from where I'm sitting at this very moment in time. Let me just check. Yeah, let me just click one end of the line there and the other arrow on the peak of the Hill of Slain, which is there. And it is... Uh, just over 11 kilometers and in miles that is yep 6.95 it's seven miles from where i'm sitting he's saying that patrick landed at the boyne estuary walked across land arrived at furtifer fake which we assume is slain and lit the paschal fire it just so happened that when he lit the paschal fire at easter that this was the time when the what he calls the high tide of the heathen Don't sugarcoat it, honey. Don't sugarcoat it. Call them heathen, even though they're just different than you and have different beliefs. Fesh Charo, what's the difficulty with this? The difficulty is that Fesh Charo was held at Samhain. And there are a number of sources that clarify and verify that for us. Fesh Charo was not held at Easter time. And in fact, I have often questioned why the High King of the apparently heathen, pagan, dark Irish uh, was, was lighting a fire coinciding with Easter. Of course, it could be that the church scribes were uncomfortable with the fact that there is a pre-Christian origin to the Easter fire. And of course, one of the big arguments or disagreements that emerged in the early church in Ireland uh, was around the calculation of Easter because the Roman way of calculating it was to make sure that it could never fall on the same day as Passover uh, because they wanted to distance the origins of Easter from Passover. So they basically moved Fesh Charo forward in the calendar by five months, March. April, May, June, no, sorry, seven months. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Eight months. Bloody hell. Right? Um, that is something that you don't see a lot of commentary about. It just so happened that at Easter, which we're told, by the way, very specifically, occurred uh, the, the day upon which Patrick lit the Paschal fire was the eve of Easter Sunday. It was Saturday, Easter Vigil Saturday, and that it was the 26th of March in 432 AD. How the hell could Fesh Charo be, be, be uh, in full swing in March when it was held at Samhain? Now, there's a further dispute there about uh, the, uh, the meaning and the origin of Samhain. And a very interesting post in that regard by my good friend, uh, Simon Tute, over on Monumental Ireland in the last year or so uh examines that anyway i think that there's a bit of shall we call it higgledy piggledy going on here you know um i think that things are being moved around to suit the agenda the kings and the lords and the chiefs used to come to tara to lara son of nile lara mcneil to celebrate that festival therein well there is a tradition that indeed that is something that happened. The difficulty with this is that it didn't happen at Easter. Peter Shields is in the house. Hello, Peter. You're very welcome. <coughs> Kelly B says, you live around lots of history then. You're lucky Irish men indeed. Uh, there's tons of it around here. We're in the richest area the entire microcosm of the story of ireland is contained within a 20 minute drive of where i'm sitting right now Tar tara would have the wow factor uh if the fire was there but you'd have to be very brave yeah interesting question why didn't he just light it there but we'll get to that the druids oh he says wizards but i'm changing that to druids 
The Druids also and the augurs would come so that they were prophesying to them. On that night, then, the fire of every hearth in Ireland was quenched and it was proclaimed by the king that no fire should be kindled in Ireland before the fire of Tara and that neither gold nor silver should be taken as compensation from him who should kindle it, but that he should go to death for his crime. So what they're saying in short is that all fires were quenched and then the king lit a new fire, the fire uh, ostensibly of Fesh Charo, the Feast of Tara, and that only after the king's fire was lit and visible could other people light their fires. But as I say, the great difficulty with this story is that Fesh Charo was not apparently held at Easter, or was it? Patrick knew not that, and even he ha he had known it, this would not have hindered him. In other words, he was going to light the goddamn Paschal fire, whether there was a law prohibiting the lighting of a fire before the king's fire or not, even if the penalty was death. As the folk of Tara were biding there, biding, waiting, at some distance from them, the Paschal consecrated fire which Patrick had kindled. Sorry, they saw at some distance from them, the Paschal consecrated fire which Patrick had kindled. Now, important in this story is the fact that the Hill of Slain and the Hill of Tara are intervisible. And if you've been on any, on any of my tours, you'll know that when we're at Slain, I point out where Tara is, and when we're at Tara, I point out where Slain is. So this is important. They are actually intervisible. So if Patrick wanted to make that sort of statement, and he wanted to doff two fingers in the direction of the High King, well, Slain would be a great place to do it, providing it wasn't a misty or a rainy night, which it often is in Ireland, but let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story. It lighted up the whole of my Bray. Now, the plain of Brega is uh, co-extant with the modern county of Meath, uh, and for one fire to light up the entire plain of me that's kind of a bit of a stretch of the imagination however on a clear night that fire on slain would be seen from much of what is county Meath, except for those parts lying on the lee side of a hill blocking the view then said the king quote that is a breach of the of the ban and the word ban here is translated from geshi it was a gasa a taboo that is a breach of the ban and law of mine. Go and find out who hath done so. Excuse the archaic English. We see, say the Druids, the fire. And we know that unless it is quenched on the night on which it was made, it will not be quenched till doomsday. Which is another interesting thing. The Druids are basically watching the fire from Tara. And they're looking towards Slain and they can see the fire burning. And they tell the king, well, unless it's put out tonight, it'll burn till doomsday. Like, uh, lads, thanks for the support. Like, just go and extinguish the feckin' thing, will you? He, moreover, who kindled it, will vanquish the kings and lords of Ireland unless he is forbidden. And now the king's really starting to worry. He's like, uh, lads, uh, I thought I was paying you to, to kind of, you know, uh, be on my side. And here you're uh, prophesying all sorts of weird shit. When the king heard that, he was mightily disturbed, as you can imagine. Then said the king, this shall not be, but we will go, saith he, and slay the man who kindled the fire. Which is very interesting, because he just assumed that it was a man who lit the fire. How did he know it wasn't a woman, a woman, or a party of women, for instance? Wow. Then his chariots and his horses were yoked for the king, and they went at the end of the night to the graves of Feach's men. They went to Ferta for Feach. At the end of the night. And we're told, perhaps in Morocco, but one of the traditions about the Paschal Fire was, was lit at dusk, long old night. Thou shouldst take heed, say the Druids, not to go to the place where the fire was made, that thou mayest not do reverence to the man who kindled it. But stay outside, and let him be called out to thee, that he may judge that thou art the king, and that he is the subject. And we will argue in your presence. So in, in plain English, 
what the druid is uh or the druids plural are saying to the king is uh listen when we get there don't just go up directly to the place stand off from it a little bit and make him come out to meet us because if you go in there you're at more of a chance of being converted it is good advice saith he the king it shall be done as ye say they came thereafter and unyoked their horses and their chariots before the graves there are mounds on the top of the hill of slain which are undoubtedly pre-christian the burial places of the men of fake perhaps patrick is called out to them and they made a rule that no one should rise up to meet him lest he should believe in him so patrick comes out and the king says to the lads listen little rule here lads don't stand up and greet him because if you do there's more of a chance that he'll convert you <laughs> like this stuff was promulgated for generations in irish classrooms and never ever was any of it challenged because of the piety and because of the seriousness of doubting you know it, it was the equivalent of blaspheming uh you know uh, the good word or the holy word as it were and nobody ever challenged it and now i believe that a more secular uh people as the irish are today can look at this stuff and go ah lads come on you know you know you've got to be a, you've got to realize what little fact is here and how much fable is here which is exactly what it says in the title of today's episode separating fact and fable or separating if you prefer fact from fable or fable from fact so patrick arose and went forth and saw the chariots and the horses unyoked Remember, if you stand up, you're in danger of being converted. If you stand up, it's a sign you respect them and you, you might believe in something even though you've never heard it before. <coughs> Fascinating. Then he chanted the prophetic verse, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we in the name of the Lord, our mighty God. They were biding before him with the rims of their shields against their chins. They're basically looking over the rims of the shields, you know, cowering behind the shields. Like, Don't stand up, anyone. Don't stand up. If you stand up, it means you believe. <laughs> You'll be converted. Stay behind your shield. And none of them rose up before him, save one man only, in whom was a nature from God, namely Urk, son of Deg. E-R-C, son of Deg, D-E-G. He is the Bishop Urk, who is today in slain of my brain that's the first mention of slain so that's where we get the idea that fur to fur fake is at slain but it doesn't directly tell us that it tells us that the paschal fire was lit at fur to fur fake it tells us that the king and his retinue went to fur to fur fake to kill the person who lit the fire it tells us that the first one he converted was urk uh uh, and that he is the Bishop Urk who is today in Slain of Mybray. It does not say that Furta, Furfeak and Slain are the same place, but we assume that to be the case. Patrick bestowed a blessing upon him, and he believed in God and confessed the Catholic faith, and, uh, and it was baptised. And Patrick said to him, Thy city on earth will be high, will be noble, and Patrick's successor is forever bound to dot 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 ellipsis there's obviously text missing and uh, sorry is his successor is forever bound to something 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 his knee before Urk's successor after receiving his homage is that to bend his knee before Urk? thy city on earth will be high why is he promising him something on earth is the promise not for the afterlife usually each then asked tidings of the other namely patrick and lyra or leary you'll hear uh, a very anglicized pronunciation of lyra the wizard the druid lochru went angrily and noisily with contention and questions against patrick and then did he go astray into blaspheming the trinity and the catholic faith patrick thereafter looked wrathfully upon him and cried with a great voice unto god and this he said lord 
who canst do all things, and on whose power dependeth all that exists, and who hast sent us hither to preach thy name to the heathen, let this ungodly man, who blasphemeth thy name, be lifted up, and let him forthwith die. When he said this, the druid was raised into the air, and forthwith again cast down, and his brains were scattered on the stone, and he was broken in pieces, and died in their presence. The heathen were adread at that. Another example, so we have the druid at the mouth of the Boyne, where Patrick blessed the earth, and it swallowed the druid. Now we have another one, who Patrick apparently lifts up into the air and makes him fall again, and his brains are dashed against the rocks. This is the sort of stuff I have no doubt that has led modern pagans to believe that Patrick committed some sort of atrocity or a genocide against pagans. Folks, you have to be able to realise what is factual and what is mythological. This is clearly mythological stuff. Not, didn't actually happen. Somebody should have written in the margin. Not an actual um, record. Not of an actual fully factual record of events. You know? Uh, like at the end of a dramatised version of events in a, a film or a documentary where it says, you know, um, you know, uh, it's a bit like that Simpsons episode, you know, um, you're not supposed to imagine that absolutely everything that is related in the tripart life of Patrick is true. So it behoves you if you are, let's call it pagan or you uh, subscribe to a belief other than Christianity. It behoves you that if you're going to look critically on the material about Patrick uh, and to, to be disdainful of him and what he represents, you should have at least a modicum of um, a critical analysis. And to be able to say, well, yeah, you know, uh, we hate Patrick because he did this, that, and the other. And to understand that this was written ninth century, which is five centuries after he existed actually four at least four centuries after he existed you know i it doesn't take a genius to realize that some of this is clearly mythological you know alison coogan no actual brains were dashed here yes no animals were harmed in the making of this movie no actual brains were dashed upon actual rocks you know uh, Anne McCallum thinks I'm enjoying this too much. I am, kind of, you know. Uh, I, uh, uh, it's a, a real shame that Dave Allen is not informing us on this subject, says Lily. I agree. Dave Allen was brilliant. Um, it's just the uh, incredulity of the whole thing. that You see so much stuff, as I say, sp particularly on St. Patrick's Day, so much stuff where you'd like to kind of take the person aside and just give them a little bit of instruction. Say, look, read this and understand that most of this is made up, basically. Come on. It doesn't take a genius to work out that a crozier doesn't fall out of the sky and that a man doesn't get magically lifted up into the sky and dropped again so that his brains dash on the rock just because another man says that should happen. The king then was greatly enraged against Patrick and wished at once to kill him. Lyra said this to his household, Slay the cleric! When Patrick saw this, the heathen arising against him, he cried with a great voice and said, Let God arise, and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Like as the smoke vanisheth, so let them vanish. Like as max wax melteth at the fire, so let the ungodly perish at the presence of God. Unquote. That's Patrick. Nice guy. At once, darkness came over the sun, and a great earthquake and trembling of arms took place there. Despite the fact that Ireland lives in a zone outside of the earthquake zones, and we only have once in a while what we call tremors. 
we don't generally have sort of major earthquake uh major tectonic activity johnny wilson's watching from texas dallas good afternoon to you johnny hope you're in good form happy st sheila's day it seemed to them that the sky fell on the earth and the horses went off in fright and the wind whirled the chariots through the fields wow now we're seeing patrick's power fully manifest of course he's really just working god's power through himself isn't he and each rose up to the other in the assembly so that each of them was after slaying the other and 50 men of them fell in that uprising by patrick's curse wow no without patrick having to do much cause an earthquake and cause the sky to fall down and, and cause the winds to whirl the chariots around apparently Lara's men start killing each other folks that is mythological the heathen fled thence on every side so that only three remained namely Lara and his queen and one of his household and they feared greatly and the queen to wit angus daughter of tasach son of leahan came to patrick and said to him oh just and mighty man do not destroy the king the king shall come to thee and shall do thy will and shall kneel and believe in god so lyra went and knelt to patrick and gave him a false peace because like in his mind he's going i am and my feck god give this man me you know my oath and, and my bond and all the rest Not long thereafter, the king called Patrick to him apart, and he meditated killing him, and this came not to pass. God manifested that to Patrick. Wow. So the king had his soothsayers. What did he call them? His. The augurs. But uh, Patrick has his in the form of God. God tells him what's going on in Lara's mind. Magic stuff. God manif manifested that to Patrick. Lara said to Patrick, Come after me, O cleric, to Tara, that I may believe in thee, in the presence of the men of Ireland. <laughs> All nicey-nicey. And straight away, he set an ambush on every path from the graves of Phaix men to Tara before Patrick to slay him. Again, Note that they're still referring to Ferta, Ferfeak. They're not referring to Slain. And basically, uh, Lyra pretends to believe and pretends to be suddenly Paddy's best friend and says, I shall come on to Tara and I'll confess belief there and to look, everything will be grand while really uh, laying uh, ambushes uh, uh, in his path it, with the intention of killing him. But God permitted not this to him. Patrick went with eight young clerics and Benane as a gilly with them, and Patrick blessed them before going. A cloak of darkness went over them, so that not a man of them appeared, which sounds very like something that we have from Tua the Danon mythology, which will get the very same name in a moment, the Feth Feada, the cloak of invisibility that covered the Tua the Danon, made by Mananon, so that they would remain invisible to mortal, mortal men and women. <clears throat> I can assure you, Anne, it is water. I am jobber as a sudge. But I will imbibe a little drop after we're finished to good old Sheila. How be it, the heathen who were biding in the snares, basically those whom were waiting uh, for Patrick uh, to ambush him and kill him. Saw only eight deer going past them under the mountain and behind them a fawn with a bundle on his on its shoulder. That was Patrick with his eight and Benane behind them with his tablets on his back. So they were able to pass. And uh, of course that gives rise to uh, the deer's cry, uh, the feth feather. Uh, which is basically the breastplate of Patrick. That is the prayer that many children were to be heard uh, uh, saying uh, dutifully 
over the course of many years in Ireland, and which I actually remember uh, from uh, my own youth. Uh, I, I was raised in uh, Catholicism. Uh, Christ to protect me. This is only a part of it. Christ to protect me day against today against every poison, against burning, against drowning, against death wounds, so that I may have a multitude of rewards. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. You'll, hear, you'll have heard that. Christ be before me, Christ be behind me. Christ in me, Christ below me, Christ above me, Christ at my right, Christ at my left. Christ in breath, Christ in length, Christ in height. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks to me. Christ in the eye of everyone that sees me. Christ in the ear of everyone that hears me, and so on and so forth. Thereafter went Lyra at daybreak to Tara in grief and in shame, together with a few that had escaped with him. So he gets back to Tara at daybreak. They didn't extinguish the fire. They didn't kill Patrick. Uh, Patrick caused a lot of the Druids to kill each other. He converted one, Urk, who became the first Bishop of Slain. And Lyra basically heads back to uh, Tara with his tail between his legs. On the following day, the men of Ireland went to Tara to carouse, which is... Uh, a, to have a noisy, lively drinking party. I'm not the one to say that would be typically Irish. When they were carousing and thinking of the conflict they had fought on the day before, which is strange because most of them were killed. Weird. They saw Patrick standing still in the middle of Tara and the doors being shut as when Christ came into the dining room. Because Patrick thought, I will go, saith he, that I may manifest my readiness before the men of Ireland. It is not a candle under a vat that I will make of myself. So Patrick, having been disguised as, a, you know, a little herd of deer uh, traveling from Slain to Tara, suddenly arrives in the middle of Tara. It is not a candle under a vat that I will make of myself, so that I may see, saith he, who it is that will believe in me and who will not believe. No one rose up before him in the house, save only Dovtok Maku Lor, king poet of the island of Ireland and of the king, and a stripling of his household named Feok, a young man, basically. It is he, Feok, who is in Schlevte today. I don't know where that is. S-L-E-I-B-T-E. -E. Now, that Dovtok is the first man who believed in God in Tara on that day. Patrick bestowed a blessing on him and on his offspring. <clears throat> so, we have the same thing as we had at Slain, where the men were saying, listen, don't rise up before him when he comes down, because uh, you'll be at risk of believing if you do. And apparently, the, uh, the king poet of the island of Ireland uh, and uh, one of the young men of his household rose up before Patrick and uh, yeah, there you go. He believed and was converted. Patrick then is summoned to the king's couch. I hope it's a comfortable couch. That, uh, I hope there's uh, brandy and cigars. That he might consume food and be proven in prophecy. Patrick refused not that because he knew what would come thereof? The druid Lucat Moil went to drink with him because he had a mind to avenge on Patrick what he had done the day before to his comrade Lochru. Uh, Lochru was the one who he raised into the air and made fall again and dash his brains against the rocks. Isn't that, isn't that the one? So Lucat Moil put a sip of poison into the cup that stood at Patrick's hand so that he might see what he would do unto it. Patrick observed that. <laughs> you can't sneak anything past the bowl, Paddy. And he blessed the cup and the liquor curdled. He then inverted the vessel and out of it fell the poison which the wizard had put into it. Patrick again blessed the cup and the liquor was turned into its proper nature. God's name and Patrick's was magnified thereby. This is what Patrick recited over the cup. Guy view. I can't read it. Anyway, the translation is, though we have knowledge of it, though we have not, it shall be quaffed in the name of Jesus Christ. Then came the hosts till they were all biding without Tara in the plain. Basically, in modern English, they were all waiting outside Tara around the whole area. Let us, said Lukat Moil, 
work miracles before the host in that great plain. Said Patrick, which be they? Said the wizard or the druid, let us bring snow on the plain till the plain be white in front of us. Said Patrick to him, <coughs> he's being challenged basically. I have no desire to go against God's will. It wouldn't be entirely unusual for there to be snow uh, by Easter time in Ireland. It's more unusual in April, but not unheard of. It's actually totally unusual in May. Said the wizard, I will bring the snow on the plain, although it be not thy desire. Then he began the chants of wizardry, wizardry and the art of devilry. See the way they twist everything, the art of devilry. It's okay if Patrick turns the sky dark and dashes a druid's brain. That's all Christian magic. But if a druid does it, it's devilry. So that the snow fell till it reached men's girdles. They all, page turn, they all saw and marveled greatly. Said Patrick, we see this. Put it away if thou canst. Said the wizard, I cannot do that till this day, till this hour tomorrow. By my God's doom, saith Patrick, it is in evil thy power stands and not in good. In other words, the druid was able to make it snow so that men were covered up to their girdles, up to their chins, presumably. But because the druid confessed he wouldn't be able to take it away, uh, Patrick uh, alleges that his power is only in bad things and not in good. Patrick blessed the plain throughout the four quarters. Quicker than speech, at Patrick's word, the snow vanished. Without rain, without sun, without wind. Just like that, folks. A druid made it happen. Patrick makes it disappear in a flash. <clears throat> uh, not gurgle, uh, Desiree. A uh, girdle, G I R D L E. Yeah. Then at the wizard's incantation, druid, came darkness over the face of the earth. So Patrick did this early and it was perfectly fine, but now the druid's doing it. Thence the hosts cried out, or thereat the hosts cried out. Said Patrick, dispel the darkness. The wizard said, I cannot today. Patrick prayed to the Lord and blessed the plain and the darkness was banished and the sun shone and all gave thanks. So all of the foregoing, need it be kind of pointed out, if you happen to have a strong opinion about Patrick and the fact that he was supposed to have committed, you know, all sorts of atrocities, just remember that a lot of this is, shall we say, not exactly what you'd call dependable factual material. Let's separate fact from fiction here. Fact from fable. Alison suggests that Patrick was practicing global warming at an early age. He was warming up for it. Uh, uh, see what I did there? Never mind. Um, yes, indeed. They were for a long while at this contention in the presence of the king. And even as Nero said to Simon Magus and to Peter, do you say Magus or Magus? Saith the king to them, cast your books into water and we will honor him whose books shall come out unhurt. Patrick replied, I will do so. And the druid said, I am unwilling to go with him to the ordeal of water, for he hath water as a god. The druid said this because he had heard that Patrick used to baptize with water. And the king answered, cast them into the fire. And Patrick said, I am ready. But the druid, unwilling, said, this man, turn about in alternate years, venerates as a god, now water and now fire. That will not be done, saith Patrick, but since thou sayest that I adore a god of fire, thou shalt go, if thou art willing, apart into the house, a, 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 or sorry, into a house completely shut up, and a cleric of my household before thee, <coughs> and my chasuble around thee, and thy wizard's tunic around my cleric, and fire shall be put into the house, so that God may deal dooms on you therein. That council was settled then by them, that is, the men of Ireland around Lyra. Then came to Patrick the three children who were abiding in hostageship with Lyra, 
They weep to Patrick. Patrick asks, what is the matter? A prince's troth, say they, hath been broken in the chief city of the Gael, namely the house that is a building uh, as, as well as, uh, as well for question mark the wizard as thy servant thus it is a building half thereof fresh and half dry the fresh half for the wizard and the dry for the thy servant patrick puts his finger on the right cheek of each of the children and he puts a tear from the cheek of each child on his left palm and he breathes under them the tears and makes three gems thereof the children swallowed the gems three special gems saith patrick will be born from them to wit column kill and Covgal and finia irish saints wow it's, a bit, it's all a bit weird what Paddy's doing uh, in relation to the miracles around the children. Thereafter, the house was built, one side of it dry, the other fresh. Then the wizard was sent into the fresh side with Patrick's chasuble, chasuble around him. Then Benane was sent into the dry side with the wizard's tunic around him. So the house was closed around them and a bar was put dot, 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 uh, something missing, ellipsis, and uh, on it outside before the host and fire is set therein. A mighty marvel came to pass there through Patrick's through Patrick's prayer. The fresh half of the house was burnt, and the wizard in the midst of the chasuble and the fire destroyed not the chasuble in the in the least. The dry half, however, wherein Benane was biding, was not burnt, and Benane was saved in the midst of the wizard's tunic, and the tunic was burnt, so that the fire made ashes thereof. Well, what a miracle! Well, what do you know? Well, that's it's not isn't that I don't I, I don't think you are expecting that turn in the tale at all now, are you? Fact versus fable. The king was much in, enraged with Patrick for killing his wizard or his druid. He arose and wished to kill him at once. Not the first time Lero was seized with the wish to kill Patrick. Uh, but through Patrick's intercession, God permitted him not. There you go. Thereafter, God's anger fell on the impious people. Wait till you hear this. So that a great multitude of them perished. To wit, 12,000 in one day. Wow. And there it is. There in the tripart life of St. Patrick is the so-called evidence pro propagated all over the internet by some people of certain beliefs, certain modern beliefs, that Patrick committed genocide against the pagans. Folks, read my lips. That is mythological. That is not historical. That did not really happen. And if you think it did, I think that you are suffering the same fate or suffering, should I say, the same deficiency as many religious people. You're, really, you're reading a metaphorical religious text as if it were 100% factually recorded history. 12,000 people did not drop dead at Tara because uh, God commanded it because he was annoyed at the fact that King Lyra tried to kill St. Patrick. Come on! Weren't we talking over the last few weeks and over months and months and years and years about in fact the factual reality of what happened when Christianity came to Ireland. Christianity and paganism wedded in a way. They got into bed together, metaphorically. The scribes needed the kings. The kings needed the scribes. The very notion that uh, because Lyra uh, ha had the intent of killing Patrick, led to 12,000 people dropping dead in one day. Come on, seriously, do you really need me to tell you that? No. Patrick, however, said, we're nearly finished, said to Lyra, unless thou believest now, thou shalt die quickly, for God's anger will come on thy head. 
When the king heard those words, great fear seized him. Now, fear of death is not something that easily seized the kings of medieval Ireland. We know that, in fact, they welcomed the idea of, uh, for them, death was just a new beginning. Then the king went into the assembly house to his people. For me, saith he, belief in God is better than what is threatened to me, namely that I shall be killed. So then Lara knelt to Patrick and believed in God, but he did not believe with a pure heart. And on that day, many thousands believed. Hmm. Many thousands left over from the 12,000 who previously died. Just like most of the Druids at Slain killed each other, but a big party of them still managed to arrive back at Tara the next morning. Hmm. Something's wrong with the maths here, folks. Then Patrick said, since thou hast believed in God and done my will, length of age will be given to thee in thy kingdom. In reward, however, of thy disobedience some time ago, there will not be king or crown prince of thee save Louis, son of Lyra, because his mother besought Patrick not to curse the child that was lying in her womb. Patrick said this, till he, till he opposes me, I will not curse him. Then Louis took the realm and went to Ochu Forchi. Then he said, Is not Jan the Church of the Cleric who declared that there would be not, neither king nor crown prince from Lyra? After that, a fiery bolt was hurled from the skies against him and killed him. Wherefore, the place is called Ochu Forchi, the field of the thunderbolt. So even when Lyra apparently finally knelt in front of Patrick and said, I believe, first of all, he didn't believe with a pure heart, but secondly, he did so under extreme duress. Because Patrick basically said to him, and remember, I'm not saying this is a factual representation of what happened. I'm just saying this is what's recorded in the hagiography, which should be clearly, clearly taken with not a pinch of salt, uh, not a thimble of salt, not a cupful of salt, but a whole bloody bucket of salt. Do not fall into the trap. Lyra believed under the threat of death. I'm telling you, that is not. What was it we were reading? It was, I think it was uh, uh, Joyce's Social History of Ancient Ireland, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, where a king refused to believe because what was it he couldn't believe he couldn't countenance the notion uh, that was being portrayed in terms of heaven and hell and where his brethren were the people who had ruled before him and his ancestors and he just thought well no thanks i'm not going to convert um i just can't you know, can't, can't countenance the idea. I must uh, uh, dig that out. Um, so what we didn't get around to, it is 18 minutes to 10 p.m. We have been talking, I have been talking, you've been patiently listening for over an hour and a half. Uh, I was going to quote some of the words from Patrick, his own words, uh, by Joseph Duff, Duffy, which is a translation of uh, St. Patrick's Confessio, uh, his own words. Uh, and we should say something about that in that uh, uh, the Patrick that we encounter in the Confessio is a much more relatively humble man, uh, not this very um, threatening and, and, and frightening and solemn figure who is basically from his arrival at Ferta Fer Feik, he, he, he causes a serious amount of hell. <laughs> he saw he, call, he causes mayhem, right? But just consider the very first words of the Confessio. I am Patrick, a sinner, the most unlearned of men, the low, lowliest of all the faithful, utterly worthless in the eyes of many. He's a much more humble man than that portrayed, the figure portrayed in the hagiographies. Lexi Erickson has enjoyed this hour and a half. Well, I'm glad, but I, I hope at least I put at least some 
meat on the bones, as it were, around, I think, where some of the confusion ar uh, uh, arises in relation to modern, a lot of modern pagans in particular have this notion that Patrick and therefore Christianity committed some sort of genocide against the pagans. If you take that material literally, <coughs> it's easy to see how you would come up with that conclusion. But in reality, that is not what really happened. I think there's a reason it's called mythology. Yeah, but as I say, this is, a lot of this material for a long, long time went unchallenged, critically unchallenged, because, well, it wasn't fashionable to do so. And of course, in previous times, let's call it as it is, folks. Those of you who are not from Ireland and are not familiar with the social and religious and political history of Ireland, especially in the 20th century, I couldn't have done this a generation ago. If I had been writing about this in, say, the 1970s, and I had just said the things I said and was a little bit scornful or a little bit mocking of the idea that this is a truthful account, I possibly could have been scorned, not just from the pulpit and by the clergy, but in actual fact in general, because the clergy had a, a very strong hold over the Irish people. Somebody could be, look, where the, this is the country where uh, women were put away because they had children out of wedlock. I mean, my God, what what about the men, you know? Um, ah, look, don't, don't, Anthony, don't go there. It's, 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 it's it's too much. People are in, people are in good form, but you, you get where I'm going with that, you know. Um, just catching up with comments. When Anthony stays clear of rabbit holes, we turn it into a Monty Python session. There's a bit of there was a bit of Mon Monty Python in that, in that. Whatever about the value of hagiographies and whatever about the insights that they give us. Never ever should they be taken as a literal biography of somebody's life and a factual representation of everything that happened. Remember that Patrick's reputation was only cemented centuries after he had actually lived. Uh, as I say, Vita Tripartita Sancti Patrici, written, originally composed, according to our, our best, uh, our best, um, the scholars in the late ninth century, 800s. That's around the time that the Vikings were coming into Ireland. It's a long time ago, but it's a long time after Patrick himself actually lived, you know. <coughs> Al Crane says, I always learn something new from these chats. Well, I'm glad. And all I ask of all of you, no matter what aspect of history or mythology or, or Irish culture you're interested in, is try to amass the facts from the broadest uh, from the broadest array of sources possible. And uh, don't copy and paste from the internet, and don't just fall for you know. There's a lot of it goes on. Um, I have tried to um, uh, curate the Facebook groups. In particular, Facebook is much worse for me. I don't have a huge following on X or Twitter. Uh, and I know Twitter can be quite vitriolic. I haven't found a great problem on Instagram. I find Instagram, the audience there seems to be pretty well behaved. On Facebook, most of the mythical Ireland community are lovely people. But just occasionally, people get very sort of hot under the collar. <laughs> collar, huh? religious, never mind. Uh, hot under the collar about these things. And then they start trading insults and getting very upset when somebody challenges something. Or even friendly challenges something. It's like... But then you get people arriving who just literally go, oh, look, there's a big long article about St. Patrick. I think I'll copy it from this group and paste it into this group. No attribution, no sources, nothing. And the problem with that is, and I read through these and I go, that's not true. That's OK. That's roughly true. Yes, that may or may not be true. That's not true. That's not true. And you're going, there's no attribution. So all the readers of who come along to the Mythical Ireland pages potentially are going to read this stuff and are potentially going to go come away going, I didn't know that. 
I didn't know that Patrick committed genocide against the pagans, and now they copy and paste it because they don't do the research or the proper, you know, checking that should be done when people are pasting stuff on social media. But that's the modern world we live in, unfortunately. I just want to continue to curate groups and pages where nobody knows all the answers nobody has the ultimate truth but where at the very least the sources are acknowledged at all times or as much as is humanly possible and where the uh, information being um uh, uh, imparted is not based on scholarly research that there is the integrity and the honesty to say that um and I believe that actually a lot of the Mythical Ireland followers on Facebook in particular really, really appreciate that aspect of the curatorship of the experience. I, When people come on and have never posted before and they paste something in that's not really true and clearly designed to, as we say in Ireland, stir the shit, uh, to stir up a row, I'll pounce on it very quickly. I'll delete it. I'll ban them if I think, if, if it's a repeat offence or I think you are only here to stir the shit and you have no, you haven't read any of the rules and you're only here. I'll just do it. I'm sorry. Now, as I said, I have on occasion been accused of engaging in censorship. I don't see it as censorship. I just see it as I have a group or a number of groups where I want people to enjoy themselves. Uh, and that is the ethos of Mythical Ireland, is to learn in a welcoming and enjoyable atmosphere. I don't want people tainting that. Uh, so sometimes you just have to say good luck to the bad eggs and just stop them and prevent them from uh, engaging in their bile. Um, so there was a post yesterday uh, by somebody who I know uh, and have a, a, a certainly a, a, an amount of respect for. And in the comments... There was some very personal stuff, and there was one in particular that uh, was foul language and all sorts of stuff. Uh, not from him, not from the original poster, from somebody else. So I just banned that person because why do? As I said, why why would you invite people into your house if they start throwing rotten fruit at your walls and kicking over your television and cutting the legs off your table? So why would you want to keep them in the house? The other people in the house are here to have a good time. They're here to learn and they're here to you know enjoy themselves. Why would you keep a few head the balls, as we, as we say in this part of the world? Why would you keep them, you know? So I don't make any apologies for it. It started a few St. Patrick's Days ago. I just noticed there's a particular trend every year on St. Patrick's Day. People who never participate in the Facebook group suddenly come along, start copying and pasting and arguing with everybody. I just don't want it. There's plenty of places you can go that will tolerate your bile. There sure, sure isn't the world, whole world of social media full of it today. Uh, you know, all the various sites. There's tons of places that you can spend the day arguing with strangers and giving out and cursing at them and, you know, uh, hurling insults at, at each other and generally wasting everybody's time. Mythical Ireland isn't one of them and it isn't going to be one of them. So thank you for your understanding. Anyway, the other side of it is, uh, pa Patrick, there, look, uh, the... I said at the outset, I mean, does anybody know for definite where Patrick is buried? Patrick and the snakes, uh, a much later invention. Uh, Patrick teaching the idea of the Trinity with the shamrock, a much later invention. And even modern renditions of Patrick, even that statue on the hill of Tara of Patrick has him dressed in a much more recent uh, a garb, um, a... a, a a, 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 an episcopal garb, a bishop, a bishop's garb, uh, and holding the crozier. He he was a much simpler man than that, Sim, much simpler clad. So there was controversy over that at the time, because uh, some artist or sculptor had come up with an idea of Patrick being very humble and just cloaked and carrying a simple wooden staff, and people didn't like it. But it's like that's probably what he was actually really like, you know. Grace Q is asking Patrick in Glastonbury. We were actually discussing that earlier on in the episode about the fact that there is a tradition that Patrick is buried in the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey. He's, he's, he's buried in Down Patrick and some people believe he's buried in Armagh. Some people believe he's buried in Mayo. I mean, 
Take your pick. Where is he actually buried? Will we ever know? Monica says, my pupils love the part with Pat Patrick teaching the shamrock. It's a funny one, you know, but that's how we were taught. When I was a kid, that's exactly how we were taught. That uh, uh, three, three and one, the Trinity, you know. Um, Grace, when we're finished, the episode will be immediately available to review. So you can maybe watch from the start and maybe pick up on that. Anyway, I was fascinated by the connections between uh, the... Uh, uh, well, St. Patrick, <coughs> pardon me, I'm getting hoarse. St. Patrick and St. Bridget both visiting um, uh, Glastonbury. Thanks, Barbara. And a very good afternoon to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Happy St. Sheila's Day to one and all. Maureen Joy says, in the USA, we say stir the pot or drink the Kool-Aid. Yes, indeed. Yes. Mariana, thank you indeed. Glad you enjoyed it. Also to Valerie Gallagher, uh, very, very grateful. <coughs> it's about coming together to ask questions and share thoughts. It's about sharing best guesses and building off what credit information we can gather. Yeah, without resorting to insults. Which it seems to go there fairly quickly with some people, which is a shame. But not any of you guys, of course. Celtic Christianity, Making Myths and Chasing Dreams by Ian Bradley is an interesting book on the early hagiographers. Have you read that one, Anthony? I'm pretty sure I have it in my library. I'm pretty sure I've read a chapter of it. I'm pretty sure I just had a huge to be read pile at the time. So I will go back to it. Pretty sure I have it. Um, must double check. Uh, but thanks, Bavanwe. Yeah, something that is so easily forgotten, Lily, that uh, there's a lot of stuff on the internet. It's like, uh, I read it on the internet, so it must be true, said Abraham Lincoln, you know? um you've seen that one i hope um uh, what's this about desire said he said he'll also dress up as a vicious sheep uh kelly b i do believe there's a little bit of truth in mythological stories yes absolutely even in greek mythology but you find a little bit of truth in some of those ancient stories yes mm -hmm. exactly but that doesn't mean the entire story is an entire factual recollection of something that actually happened of course and i know you agree with me on that Amadeus wants to play the vicious bunny. I'm only seeing Monica arrived a while ago and said that she was at work. Monica, that's perfectly okay. Work is, you know, work is work. And Connie also saying myths can contain, yes, and I absolutely believe that. Uh, and that should be obvious from a lot of things that I've said and written. Um, but yes, 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 yes. I think you, I, without laboring the point, I think you get where I'm coming from on all of this. <clears throat> um, Gary is saying he got the Franciscans to do the dirty work. They started before Patrick arrived. Yeah, Franciscans didn't come to Ireland until the 12th century. So I'm not sure how that could be uh true but um maybe i'm missing something uh wayne bird uh thank you very much and i'm enjoying all your feedback on patreon in relation to the text of the new book um so hope you enjoy it i'll be sharing more um i say momentarily but not tonight i, I i'm tired so i'll have a i'll have a I'll have a wee dram and go to bed early 322 messenger says 25th of march is an important date in the Jesus story being said to be the date that the Virgin Mary got a visit from the Archangel Abriel to announce the Immaculate Conception. Uh, immediate, I presume that is a uh, an autocorrect, the Immaculate Conception. Yes, the, uh, what's that called? The Annunciation, is it? Uh, thank you indeed. If we go full Monty Python, Amadeus is claiming the parts he's willing to pay. Play, brilliant. I look forward to it. What, could you imagine? Let's write a Monty Python-esque play based on Irish mythology and history. That'd be great fun. Thanks, Tom. Uh, good to see you, kind of. And uh, I know you're busy. Keep the faith and, uh, yeah, make lots of those bits and pieces. Look forward to seeing them all. Um, I did see something from Lexi, but it's disappeared, so I'm not sure. Anyway, all that remains for me to say right now is... I'm not sure what we'll be talking about next week. We might be back to social history of ancient Ireland. 
anyway at almost two hours <laughs> and scott already just said right that that moment two hours we're so lucky at almost two hours i think it is time i let you all go about your business and do the things that you need to do uh and uh, we'll see you all next week brendan wants to know what part i'm playing well in the typical fashion of john cleese i'll be playing a number of parts you know i, I wouldn't be just playing one in fact i would expect that from all of the lead actors actresses if you like um yeah um uh, uh, a number of uh roles for each you know thanks Mavanway. glad you enjoyed it I'm looking forward to the Monty Python slash Father Ted combo movie of St. Patrick's story. Yeah. And Gary says, I'll check my source again. It was my understanding. <coughs> yeah, I, I don't, the, well, the Franciscans didn't come to Ireland. I mean, they were kind of a Norman era arrival, you know. Um, actually, a quick Google search reveals the Franciscans were founded in 1209 by Francis of Assisi. So uh, the Franciscans couldn't have been here before Patrick. Um, uh, I should, of course, I should have known that, but I just wasn't immediately aware of uh, when when they were founded. Um, I was thinking of the Augustinians because Saint Augustine was wasn't he a contemporary of Patrick or even earlier? I think he was fourth century. Was he three hundreds something like that? Anyway, anyway, I have laboured too much and waited too long. I must go <coughs> and uh, quench the fire in the throat. Anyway, I hope you all had a great St. Patrick's weekend. Again, once again, happy St. Sheila's Day. Don't forget, please, do all the things I asked you to do. If you have the time, go to the Mythical Ireland website, mythicalireland.com, sign up for the emails, and have a look at the Prince offer. Three for the price of two. If you're in Ireland and the UK, you also get free postage. And more special offers coming very soon to celebrate the 24th birthday of Mythical Ireland. A very good night to one and all. Ika wakulasov, slán gafol, agus Good night.